Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. Let's talk candidly for a second. Our channel is about gaming and gaming related topics and in order to do something properly, you need to have a little bit of knowledge in the area. And I know for myself, I do really love gaming and I love being a gamer. However, I'm sure there are most that probably wouldn't can consider me quite a gamer and that's okay. They're probably right. However, it's the reason we started this channel and this series right here, uh, continuing on with our May Gamers Education, we're going to talk about a game that I've been excited to play for some time. Over the course of the last five months, I have found some games I have truly loved and some games that when I finished them have caused this great sense of loss. Not once, but twice. And I am sure if you follow this channel, you know what I'm talking about. And one such game in particular for me is The Last of Us. Scott and I were a little late to the party on this one. Most of the world played it for the first time at launch in 2013. We, however, were blissfully unaware. It wasn't until our friend Dennis urged us to try it that we finally got a PS3 and a digital copy in early 2018. If anything, it would pass some time and we'd have a bit of fun. Well, it did more than that. It's probably the game that I would credit to us beginning this journey of collecting, of redesigning our basement to house our new passion, and eventually starting this channel. It is with much pride, and I know pride might be a strange word to use, but nonetheless, I am proud to say that with the launch of the second installment fast approaching, I finally completed my first playthrough. I am excited to share my ups, my downs, my everything in betweens, and my thoughts both as an observer and a first time player experience of The Last of Us. Let's get started. So the first time we started this game on PS3 in 2018, I was immediately awestruck by the graphics of a game that at the time was already five years old. While it was tempting to play that one, ultimately we decided to pick up a copy of the remastered version for PlayStation 4 and I must say that same feeling has stuck. Graphically, I'm still in love with this game. There is so much beauty in the chaos, the decay, this new world that the love lives on and has me wondering how in 2020 the new game will stack up. I remember the moment Sarah dies very vividly, and for that matter, the entire opening sequence of the game. When I finally played it for the first time myself, it had been two years since I had physically seen this scene. However, I remember it like it was yesterday. I knew what was coming, and you would think that would take away from the experience, but it didn't. I had to learn the controls while anticipating what I knew would happen next, and if anything, it added a layer of helplessness that I hadn't fully experienced upon observation. Knowing that I couldn't change the outcome while controlling the character movements was devastating. Playing as a parent to a similarly aged child, there is no greater loss in the world. It is always shocking when a game, a movie, a good book starts off with killing a main character, but when that character is a child, that shock turns into a shockwave that just keeps on coming. Fast forward years later and Joel has aged considerably. He has hardened, and rightfully so. It was about this time amid character interactions that I thought, yes, this is how real people would talk. Real people would feel in a world we can only imagine. We've all played games where a good face calm is appropriate, where I can't help but mutter out loud, real people do not talk or act that way. And if you're asking me to immerse myself in this experience, and the point is to have an actual physical reaction to a game, to talk about it, to share it, to hang on to that feeling of playing it, which I believe all game developers hope to achieve, then I want a sense of realness in an unreal world. I want relatable characters. I want raw emotions. I want to connect and connect I did. And when Joel didn't immediately connect with Ellie, even though as a woman or I guess just as a human being broke my heart because she's just a child, I also thought, that's totally appropriate. He has lost a child. He's different. This world has made him different, as well as the fact that children are a huge liability. They wouldn't be looked upon by everyone with the same reverence. So of course, Ellie is by all accounts a burden, and that makes sense in that mindset. Also, the idea of transporting a living, breathing package in exchange for weapons also makes sense. 
disconnecting is easy in a disconnected, disjointed world. Joel, if given the choice on his own, most certainly would have said no to this arrangement if not for Tess. So, it shows that Joel has the ability to care about what other people think and believe in. I'm still unsure of how deep the relationship with Tess actually goes, but for a time they have survived together, and it has at least created a trust and maybe even a bond. For me, the next part of the game was one of my least favorites, as a second time experience but first time player. It is a bit slow, however the game requires ebb and flow, peaks and valleys in order to keep your interest over 20 plus hours of gameplay. I also would have hated being thrown in off the deep end so quickly starting out, so what do I know? What I do know though is that having to worry about keeping Ellie and Tess alive was massively infuriating, but accurate in a real life situation. I don't exactly recall this part from when I watched Scott playing it, but he died way less than I did. Like way, way less. So it was overloved. I hated having to navigate around two different characters. It felt like perpetually walking into a room full of cats that kept winding their bodies around your feet. I also wasn't a huge fan of winter, but that might have just been because of the snow. I'm an East Coast Canadian, I see enough of that already. And more importantly, I knew that meant the game would be ending soon going from summer to spring, and wasn't that a clever way to present a game. The analogy of ending in spring, spring being the season of renewed hope, of beauty returning to the world, and the promise of better days to come. Moving through the seasons from Boston to Salt Lake City, meeting both old and new comrades, visiting new places gave hope to this game as well. It made a point of showing how important the small victories were. Ellie discovering a comic book she once read in a time not long ago, but in a time worlds away, and then Joel finding and collecting them along their journey. The giraffes in Utah and of all wild things returning to a now wild world. Finally finding a working vehicle to make the journey a little less cumbersome. Scavenging for things necessary for survival, items that would easily be at arm's reach in normal circumstances, but this is anything but normal. And most importantly, the emphasis on community and genuine human interactions. The loss of Tess and her self-sacrifice to protect Joel and Ellie. Bill helping Joel as repayment for a favor owed. The fact that one would still follow through to repay a debt when survival is a full-time job that is never short of overtime. Of blood being thicker than water when Tommy ultimately decides to help Joel even though his new bride Maria strongly disagrees with his decision. Meeting Henry and Sam and working together to escape a group of hunters. Ellie being able to be a child for a short time while interacting with Sam, putting down the weight of the big things to be present in the moment with someone else her age. These seemingly small things play such a big role in the juxtaposition of the game. I typically hate cutscenes. I'm one who wants to play. I enjoy the constant movement of the game and the action. Sometimes too many cutscenes can ruin an otherwise great experience, but there was no fear of that in The Last of Us. All the cutscenes were purposeful or entertaining. My favorite light moment being when Ellie and Joel finally locate the truck and get on the road towards Salt Lake City and the fireflies. Pawing through her backpack, she pulls out a magazine she stole from Bill. The raw honesty of a child growing up in a grown up world. Joel taking on a parental role and demanding she get rid of it. The whole scene is hilarious but beautiful at the same time. You get to see the chaos take a back seat for a second for a pure moment to be had. This happens at various other points in the game too, but I guess this one was just my favorite and it stuck with me. It's also Ellie's way of enacting a little revenge against Bill for his attitude towards her. Teen rebellion in all its glory. I wish I could talk about all my favorite things in this game, but this video would end up being far too long. Instead, can we just talk about clickers for a second? They are hands down the worst, and I'm sure we could debate this because bloaters are pretty shitty too, but you see them in like five separate locations in the entire game, and some of them are even avoidable, but those damn clickers have a special fuck you place in my heart. Aw shit, I don't have any shivs, and I don't have enough supplies to craft any. Well you're screwed. You can only sneak around them so much. Thankfully, they are blind but in a group they are easily the most lethal because you can't kill one at a time. Well, you can, but not very easily. You need to do it without creating noise or they will swarm you and one bite is deadly. 
You might be able to use a bow if you have one, but don't dare use a gun in a group. Which leads me to and poses the next question. Would you rather fight a group of dead things or a group of living things? Oh yeah, I just went there. And to that question, there is no good or easy answer. Have I been killed by the undead? Oh yeah, countless times. They are unrelenting, they are driven by an unending hunger, and often found in dark, creepy places adding to their nightmarish existence. I mean, see for yourself. Oh, you didn't die 10,000 times? Lucky you. Remember when we talked about my skill level? But you know what? I regret nothing. At one point, my husband even offered to get me past a part if I couldn't do it. But I needed to do it myself, so give me some props. But maybe I did better at fighting the human militia, the scavengers, the lowlights. Mmm, no. While not driven by an unquantifiable hunger for human flesh, well, not most anyways, Dave it, they are hungry to survive, they are crafty and skeeving, and they can use weapons. What do I hate most? Well, honestly, in the beginning that really depended on the different points in the game. I found myself hating the hell out of the undead and thought maybe my vote would swing that way. But then again, there's a scene just outside the hotel when you're behind the scaffolding trying to avoid rapid gunfire and molotovs that made me think, if the real world suddenly goes to shit, we are the enemy. And don't get me wrong, I'm not deluded. Joel is the exact same, but hey, Joel is the hero in our story, so kill or be killed. My motto, kill everything, trust no one, and for this game, that's exactly the proper motto to have because I think, undead aside, you're really truly trying to survive the descent of humanity and that's scarier than any monster ever. I'm a bit inclined to end my thoughts here as a motto makes for a great closing statement, but I haven't shared my absolute favorite moment. I know this game has many subcontexts of the downfall of humanity, of Ellie being the key to rebuilding the broken world, of finding hope, and of the point I just mentioned before. But the key to this entire game, the glue that holds it all together and puts it in a category of its own, is in the very title itself. When Ellie saves Joel and when Joel saves Ellie, and yes, I know that this is not one singular moment, but in my opinion, it's the underlying context of the whole game, The Last of Us, of two people finding the person they need to survive. A childless father being paired up with a girded teen that needs guidance and love, and of making himself whole again, and of that child finding acceptance and safety, a feeling of security and belonging that she has never known, of finally having a family. It is when Ellie helps Joel and keeps him alive through the harsh winter and never giving up no matter the obstacle that Ellie finds her true north. Joel finally lets down his walls when he sacrifices the entire human race to save Ellie. He no longer lets the ghost of Sarah dictate his lack of action by blindly shuffling through the motions of life. Been in that one single act. You keep finding something to fight for. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Uh, thank you for watching what I guess is kind of my review of The Last of Us. Um, my thoughts, I guess, my highlights of this game. It is a game I truly love. I'm so happy I got to finally play it. Or I finally guess that I felt that I was able to play it. And uh, it's because of you guys uh, and this gamer's education that we've been able to make this all possible with you guys subbing and giving us your input and your comments. It's, it's made it all worth it. So I just wanna thank you guys for continually watching. And uh, yeah, keep on watching. We have a lot of other things in store. And until next time, game on. Mm -hmm.